the story of the ten lost tribes is shrouded in mystery and replete with legend, intrigue, and folklore. At its core, it's one of the greatest tragedies of Jewish history. It began with the worst schism and civil war in our history. The rift persisted for decades, and it was never resolved despite many valiant, concerted efforts. Ultimately, war and conquest and expulsion led the rebels to be cast away, and just like that, a significant chunk, maybe even a plurality of the nation, were exiled to parts unknown and have seemingly disappeared from the face of the Jewish history. Now, the background to this story is found in the Book of Kings. Towards the end of King Solomon's reign, God tells Solomon that because of his sins, his kingdom will be torn apart from his descendants. And that's chapter 10 of the Book of Kings. In that same chapter, we meet an individual whose name is Yeruvam ben Nevat, Jerobam ben Nevat. He's talented, he's charismatic, he's scholarly, he's a valorous tax collector, which of course is a very difficult job to be popular. He somehow as a tax collector is very popular. And he actually has the gumption and the gall to stand up to Solomon. And concurrently, the prophet Achia Hashiloni tells Yeruvim ben Nevat, this individual, that God will make him king over ten tribes, and if he's righteous, God will give him a legacy that will rival David's. So now, Yeruvim ben Nevat has uh, harbors ambitions for the throne, and King Solomon tries to have him executed. So Yeruvim ben Nevat flees to Egypt. Eventually, Solomon dies. His son Rechavam succeeds him. Now, after Solomon dies, Yeruvah ben Avat returns to the land, and he heads a delegation to meet the new king, Rechavam, and they ask for a tax cut. And Rechavam tells the delegation, give me three days to think over it, to mull over it, to discuss with my advisors. And the elder advisors tell him to listen and yield and give him a tax cut. Instead, Rechavam, the new king, the son of Solomon, decides to hearken to the advice of the young whippersnappers who said to him, you have to be tough. You, you, they, they look at you, you're vulnerable, you're naive. You're naive. You got to increase the taxes, not decrease them. So he, after three days, calls on the delegation, tells him, my father chastised you with sticks. I'm going to chastise you with scorpions. And immediately, Rechavim becomes decidedly unpopular. And he sends his tax collector to all these far-flung communities in Israel, and they stone him to death, and slowly a rebellion coalesces behind Yeruvim ben Avat. And eventually, all ten tribes, with the exception of Judah and Benjamin, they all become loyal to Yeruvim and against Rechavim, and against the house of David. Both sides mobilize for armed conflict. But at the last moment, the prophet tells Rechavam to yield, and the secession com- is completed bloodlessly. Thenceforth, the nation was divided. There's the northern kingdom of Israel, comprised of ten tribes, and the southern kingdom of Judah, comprised of two tribes, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. Now, this new king of Israel in the north, he had a potential concern to his monarchy. He knew that there's a thrice annual pilgrimage to the temple in Jerusalem. Remember, the temple was built by Solomon. It's a relatively recent phenomenon and was very excited to go visit the temple in Jerusalem and meet the entire throngs of the Jewish people three times a year on the three three festivals. And the verse tells us in the book of Kings, chapter 12, verse 26 and 27, Vayomer Yeruvim Belibo, Yeruvim, said in his heart, now 
the kingdom will return to the house of David if the whole nation will ascend to Jerusalem to do sacrifices in the house of God. And then the heart of the nation will return to their masters, to Rechavim, the king of Judah, and they'll kill me and they'll return to the king of Judah, Rechavim. So he was worried. The concern that he had was that he's going to lose his monarchy due to the pilgrimage on the festivals. And his solution is to erect idolatrous temples, to establish two golden calves, to appoint non-Levite priests, to institute new festivals and abolish others, and eventually also station soldiers along the highways to prevent his subjects from traveling and visiting the temple in Jerusalem. This is essentially a severance of these of this one nation is being severed and broken up into two. And the Book of Kings essentially is telling the parallel stories of the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. Most of the kings of Judah are righteous, but all of the 20 or so kings of Israel were wicked to varying degrees. And despite the valiant efforts of prophets such as Elijah and Elisha, the 10 northern tribes were not brought back into the fold and remained estranged from God. Of course, there's an amazing episode where Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, and he seems to prove decisively against idolatry, but then he's hounded. They try to assassinate him. He has to flee. All the efforts of the prophets do not yield the desired outcome, and the northern kingdom of Israel continues to spiritually devolve for centuries. After nearly two centuries, the ten northern tribes were captured and exiled by the Assyrian Empire led by Sancherev, alternatively called Shalmaneser. Now, this didn't happen in one fell swoop. First, there was one tribe that was exiled, then a few more, and ultimately, all ten tribes were expelled from the land and settled elsewhere. And here's where it gets a little bit confusing. The book of Kings, this is Kings 2, chapter 17, verse 6. Vayashev osam bechalach ubechavor nehargozen vaarei madai. This is the first clue as to the whereabouts of the ten lost tribes. He placed them in Chalach, in Chavar, in the river of Gozen, and the cities of Madai. Now, what happened uh, to the location, the northern part of Israel? In their place, Sancherev brought foreigners known as the Kusim or the Kuthites in the Talmud. In English, we call them the Samaritans because they took the part of the land of Israel. It's called Samaria. And these people converted to Judaism, but it remains a long-standing dispute if their conversion was sincere, if they're Geire MS, if they're true converts, or they were only scared and they were bullied into it, so, so to speak, and therefore they're fearful of the lions, they're Geire Arayos him, and therefore they're not legitimate converts. Regardless, these new neighbors of the people of Judah never integrated amongst the Jewish people and caused all kinds of anguish to the nation. Now, what happened to those 10 lost tribes? What happened to those 10 tribes that were relocated by Sancherib uh, a century and change after they seceded from the rest of their Jewish brethren? This is a very tricky question. As we read, there's one verse in the Book of Kings that tells us where they went, and the Talmud explains where, where, where these places are. The place of Chalach is a river called Chalazon. The place called Chavor is the kingdom of Chadayov, which is maybe in northern Iraq. The river of Gozen may be near Syria, and the cities of Media, which the Talmud tells us is, this, is, the, is the neighboring cities of Hamadan, which is today a huge city in, in Iran, but it gives us names of four places, Krach, Mushchi, Choschi, and Rumki, which, again, we have no idea where these places are. Uh, there is a quote from Josephus in the Book of Antiquities, 1133. He tells us that the ten tribes are beyond the Euphrates, 
and there's an immense multitude whose numbers cannot be estimated. There's tons of them, tons of Jews living on the, on the other side of the Euphrates River in Mesopotamia. It seems like from all these sources and from these locations that were told in the Talmud that they remained in the Middle East, somewhere in the Middle East. Now, the Talmud, in the Book of Sanhedrin, page 94, it gives us some other places where the ten lost tribes are. It tells us they went to Afriki, which sounds, sounds, of course, a lot like Africa. And they went to the mountains of Silurg. Where that is, no one really knows. Now, is the place that we know today as Africa, is that the same as the Afriki in the Talmud, is, again, a subject of great dispute. And finally, the Midrash tells us quite famously that these tribes were exiled beyond the river Sambation or Sabation, which we're told is from the word, the root word Sabat and Yon, from the word like Sabbath, Shabbos. Why? Because this miraculous river is impassable during the entire six days of the week because it has a very turbulent current, it's very rocky, but on Shabbos, every seventh day, it's calm. And we're told in the Midrash that the Tenlos tribes are hiding on the other side of this river, which is, for Jews, essentially impassable, because the only day you could cross it is Shabbos, and that's the day, of course, that you can cross it. And therefore, they're locked away, we'll never, we can never access them. There's an interesting anecdote in the Talmud about this particular river, it tells of a debate between Rabbi Akiva, the great leader of the Jews in the end of the first and beginning of the second century, and one of the Roman officials in Israel whose name was Turnus Rufus. And the question that Turnus Rufus asked Rabbi Akiva is, why is Shabbos special? Why is it any better than the rest of the days? And Rabbi Akiva, as Jews maybe are wont to do, answers this question with another question. He says to them, well, you're a Roman official. Well, why are you special? He says, what do you mean? I'm special because the Roman Caesar chose me to be one of his officers. He says, well, the same thing. Shabbos is special because God chose Shabbos to be special, to be his. That's the beginning of the exchange. And Turnus Rufus says, well, no, that wasn't my question. My question was not why is Shabbos special. My question is how do you know that the day that we think is Saturday is really Shabbos. Maybe we got mixed up and maybe it's really Tuesday. That's Shabbos. How would you know? And he answers them. He says, I'll bring you three proofs. Number one, the river Sabation. Go visit this river. And clearly we see that the day that it rests is the day that we consider to be Shabbos, the day that according to our calculation and our tradition is Saturday and is Shabbos, number one. Number two, necromancers, the Ove and the Yodoni doesn't work on Shabbos. And finally, in a classic barb, he tells him, well, let's look at your dad's grave because your dad is roasting in hell for six days a week and you can actually see the cloud of smoke coming out of his grave. But on Shabbos, he's given an off day and there's no cloud of smoke. That's what he tells him. Fine, but again, we see this idea that there is this river that maybe Rabbi Kiva knew its whereabouts, maybe not, that it is unique, it is rocky, it's, got, it's turbulent the rest of the week, and on Shabbos it is calm. Now, where is this river? That, too, is a great mystery. According to the Roman author Pliny the Elder, he says, he writes, that there is a river that stops flowing on Shabbos. It's found in Judea close to home. Josephus, he talks about this river. He calls the river Sabbatik, and he associates it with the name Shabbos. And he tells us that it's somewhere in Lebanon or in upper Syria and Titus. He was, of course, traveling with Titus. Uh, Titus visited it and it's something so important, so wondrous. I got to tell you about it. And he records it in his uh, book of Roman Wars. Others say that maybe this river is in Egypt or near the Caspian Sea in Iran or maybe even the Ganges River in India. The bottom line is 
no one knows. In short, in our quest to try to find out where what happened to these ten lost tribes, where are they? And where did they go to? It's very difficult because their last known whereabouts in itself is unknown. They could be anywhere in Asia to Africa. Now, we also do know that some members of these 10 tribes escaped and didn't suffer the fate of the rest of their countrymen and joined the bulk of the nation in Judah, in southern Israel. We also know that the prophet Jeremiah, 90 years after the expulsion of the Ten Lost Tribes, he went and found some of them and brought them back to the rest of the Jewish nation. We also know that Levites, the priestly tribe, they by and large rejoined the nation due to the idolatrous practices of the north and their repudiation of priesthood, and they came south and joined Judah. What about the rest of the ten tribes? What happened to them? Will we ever get them back? That, of course, is a subject of much intrigue. In the book of Sanhedrin, page 110b, there is actually a dispute about this in the Talmud. Rabbi Tiva tells us that the ten tribes are not coming back. And he quotes a verse in the end of Deuteronomy, which foretells of the ten tribes being plucked out of the land and cast away, the thrown away as this very day, just like the day passes and is gone forever, so too the ten lost tribes passed and they're gone forever. That's what Rabbi Tiva says. Rabbi Eliezer says, no, just like the day Yesterday, there was a day, and then there was no day. It was nighttime. And then there's a new day today. So too, the sun will yet rise on the 10 lost tribes. It seems like Rabbi Tiva is saying they're gone, and they're gone forever. But it's important to stress that even Rabbi Tiva, according to some commentators, even he would agree that we, in the future, we will be getting back some of the 10 lost tribes. It's only the ones that assimilated, that were absorbed by their host nations, only they are gone forever from history, whereas the ones that remained distinct as a Jewish community, they're still coming back. Regardless, the pursuit of the 10 lost tribes has captured the imagination of Jews and non-Jews throughout history, and finding them, and maybe even the mysterious Sambakion River, has always been associated with messianic redemption and rebuilding our nation, bringing all the scattered Jews together. So now let's talk about what happened to them since they disappeared. Essentially, the trail of the ten tribes runs cold for more than a millennium. No one hears from them, no one knows where they are, no one's following up with them, no one's reaching out to them, and not much progress is being made in answering the question, where are they, what is their fate? In the ninth century, a figure bursts onto the Jewish scene that ends this equilibrium. A Hebrew-speaking traveler, his name is Eldad Hadani, Eldad from the tribe of Dan, he arrives to a Jewish community in North Africa. And he tells us that he's a descendant of the tribe of Dan. And they, together with the tribes of Naphtali, Usher, and Gad, they have established a Jewish kingdom in the region of Kush, which is roughly Ethiopia or present-day Sudan. And he's speaking only Hebrew, no Arabic, No Aramaic, only Hebrew. But the Hebrew that he speaks is slightly different than the Hebrew that we speak. He's saying words that no one has ever heard before. And they, of course, assume that he's a charlatan, he's a fraud, he's a hoax, and he's just making up gibberish. And he's pointing to things and saying new Hebrew words for them. So they decide to test him. They showed him one thing, and he said 
some word that no one ever heard before. And then a few days later, they recycled that item back and he said the exact same word. Clearly, he had a different version of the Hebrew language than everyone else did. In addition, he brought with him a compendium of halacha, of Jewish law. And these laws, primarily dealing with uh, the laws of kosher slaughtering, the way they have them written down is these are the laws taught to us by Joshua, who learned it from Moshe, who learned it from God. And most of the laws are exactly identical to our laws. But some other laws are, diverge, are very different than our laws. And he also describes this river Sambation, which he alleges to encircle the kingdom and prevent anyone from leaving. And he adds another wrinkle. He says, every Shabbos, a cloud descends upon the surface of the river, preventing anyone from approaching it, and remains there until after Shabbos. He says he's in close contact with the rest of the tribes, and they don't know what to do with this individual. Do we believe him? What do we do with his laws? What do we do about the fact that his laws, in some instances, contradict ours? So they decide to write a letter to the leader of the Jewish nation at the time, who was the head of the yeshiva in Surah in Babylon. This is amid the Geonic period, when the Jews are led by the Geonim, who head the institutions of Torah in Babylon, Surah and Pumpadisa. The majority of Jews are living in Babylon at the time. And this Geon, his name is Rabbi Tzemach Bar Chaim. They write him the letter and ask, should we believe his claims? What do we do about these contradictions? And there are actually copies of the letter that they sent to the Gon and his response. And in, in their letter, they're describing that this individual claims to be from the tribe of Dan and they have a king and they judge capital punishment, the four capital punishments described in our Talmud, and they're always at war with the various teams of Kush that are surrounding them. They do have our same Bible, but they don't have the Book of Esther, because the Book of Esther was added to Jewish history after they split off, they splintered from the Jewish nation. And they don't have the Book of Lamentations either. And of course, in their Talmud, there's no great rabbis, there's no sages, it's just all, these are the teachings from Joshua, from Moshe, from God. And he also describes in the letter that this kingdom of Kush, where this Eldar Dani claims to come from, undergoes constant warfare. And he describes, well, there's four tribes, and each tribe, therefore, is responsible for defense of the kingdom for three months out of the year. And he's describing the methods that they're using to defend their kingdom from their enemies. Who are their enemies? They're the descendants of Shimshon, of Samson. When Samson married his Philistine wife, uh, Delilah, they had children who are these monster athletes who are the opposition of the Jews from these four tribes. And six days a week, the soldiers of the Jewish army are on their horses and they don't get off of it the whole week. And when it's Arab Shabbos, they get off their horses unless there's an actual war. Then they have to fight the war in order to survive. And the question that they have for the Gon is about these traditions and these discrepancies between their tradition and our tradition. What to do? What to do when they say we are wrong and we have a, an unadulterated version of the oral Torah tradition. So the Gon responds, don't worry about the differences. There's many times there's disagreements between even today, the sages in Israel and the sages in Babylon. And he speculates that maybe this Eldad maybe forgot some of the laws while traveling. Who knows? Maybe because of the 
traversing half the world to get to you, maybe that caused them to forget some of the loss. But this seems that uh, the the great the great Gaon, he's addressing this El Daradani as a rabbi, and he's according him a lot of honor. And it seems from his letter that they believe the testimony of this kingdom of the tribe of Dan to be true. Others contest that claim. Uh, now, it's interesting, throughout history, throughout the history uh, ongoing from this point, the claims of El Hadani are subject to dispute. In the beginning of their commentary to Hulin, for example, the Tosafos, the Tosafos are, is, the, is, the, is the academy of Rashi. In every page in Talmud, in the inner margins, you'll find the commentary of Rashi. In the outer margins, you find the commentary of Tosafos. The very first comment on the book of Hulin quotes a book called Hilchos Eretz Yisrael, the laws of the land of Israel, which according to the sages is, and quoted by the other commentaries of the medieval era, this is this book of the laws of kosher slaughtering brought by Eldan Hadani from the Ten Tribes. It seems clearly that at least some of the great sages that came centuries hence actually believed everything that this Eldar Hadani claimed to be true. On the other side, you have the Ibn Ezra, for example, in his commentary to Exodus 2.22, he repudiates all these kinds of books. The verse there is talking about Moshe's family. Uh, Moshe has a son who he calls Gershom. Why? Why does he call him Gershom? Because he says, I was a foreigner in a foreign land. Says the Ibn Ezra in his commentary. As for those matters that are written in the Chronicles of Moshe, which is some book, don't believe them. And I will tell you an important principle. Every book that was not written by prophets or by sages from tradition, do not rely upon them. For example, the book of Zerubbabel, and then he ends, Vigam Sefer Eldad Hadani V'domer Lehem. Also, the book of Eldad Hadani and the ones that are similar to it. He is clearly quite dubious and skeptical on Eldad Hadani and his claims and the fact that we should even consider his laws of Torah that he brings with him to be uh, substantial. Now, in the 15th and 16th century, there was a great rabbi whose name is Rabbi David ben Zimmer, known as the Radvaz. And he wrote a responsa in the book called Divrei David. This is responsa number five, where he addresses the question, are Jews who come from this place called Kush, or people claiming to be Jews, are they really from the tribe of Dan and are they Jewish or not? And he says in the end of, in the end of, his, lesson, uh, of his letter, those who come from the land of Kush are undoubtedly from the tribe of Dan. And even if there is a doubt about the matter, it is a mitzvah to redeem them. But I am worried that they are mamzerim, that they are halachic bastards, because their kedushin, their halachic marriage is valid, but their gitin, their halachic divorces, are not. Essentially what he's telling us here is that these people who claim to be from the tribe of Dan, they really are from the tribe of Dan, and therefore they really are Jewish, but they're not observant because they have departed from the ways of the tradition. And that renders them problematic, not as Jews, but as Jews who are allowed to marry into the Jewish nation. Now, based upon this evidence, Rabbi Avadia Yosef, who was the chief rabbi of Israel and the greatest Sephardi halakha authority of the 20th century, he wrote a seminal responsum in Yabia Omer 8, Evan Ezer 11. He wrote a a halachic, he rendered rendered a halachic ruling in 1973, ruling that the Ethiopian Jews, 
known as the Falashas, or the Beta Yisrael, are indeed Jewish. And he writes a whole essay explaining his position, and he concludes, L'chein bati l'maskana. Therefore, I have arrived at the conclusion, Sheha falashim, that these falashim, these are descendants of the tribes of Israel that went south to Cush, and there is no doubt that the Gaonim, who affirm that they are from the tribe of Dan, they investigated it properly, and they arrived at that conclusion based upon witness testimony and proofs that are believable. And therefore, who is the one to claim against an entire congregation of our nation that they are invalid, they are not, they are not true Jews? And therefore, he, he, also, he adds that these Falashim, these Ethiopian Jews, they wouldn't do any business with non-Jews, and if they did, they would have to go and uh, ritually dunt themselves in a mikvah, and he gives many examples. He himself interviewed some of those Falashim, and they showed that they had a very strong sense of community as a Jewish nation, or as a Jewish community that just existed apart from the rest of their brethren for thousands of years. And he goes on to stridently reject those who quibble with their Jewish roots based upon non-Torah scholars. Don't look at what the secular sources say. How could you discard the Torah sources in favor of the secular sources? These are Jewish. These people are Jewish, as Jewish as you and me. That's what he says. And then he continues... I was requested by the leaders of the Falashim. They want to reconnect with the rest of the Jews in the spirit of Torah and Halacha, the written Torah, the oral Torah, to fulfill all the mitzvahs of of the Holy Torah through the interpretation of the Talmud. And therefore, it's critically important not to delay. We have to save them from assimilation. We have to expedite their emigration to Israel. We have to educate them in the spirit of our holy Torah. We have to partner with them in building our holy land. And therefore, he says, I reached out to the members of the Knesset, to the government, and to the Jewish agency, and to all the organizations in Israel and in the diaspora to do everything we can to bring the Ethiopian Jews to the land of Israel. And indeed, in 1975, the government based primarily upon this opinion of Rabbi Vadia, they affirmed that these Ethiopian Jews are Jewish for the purposes of the law of return, an Israeli law that states that any Jew is automatically granted citizenship. That said, Rabbi Vadia was a little bit of a maverick on this particular point. Many of the other authorities, they say, well, because there is some doubt they should do what's called a gerus lechumra. They should do a conversion just to cover all bases. And that indeed is what has happened with the majority of the Ethiopian Jews. They come to Israel, and if they want to live amongst the Jews, they are advised to just to cover all bases, make a conversion. In the 12th century, the Jewish Marco Polo's name was Benjamin of Tudela. He was a traveler from Spain, and he traveled all over the world. He went all different places of uh, all different parts of, of Europe, in Asia, even India, and then circled back through Arabia, and then dipped into Africa until crossing all over Africa, and then going back to Spain. He spent essentially fifteen years traveling the world, and detailing what he discovered and who he met and all the communities that he visited in a Hebrew book called Masaot Benjamin, The Travels of Benjamin. It's interesting that Marco Polo gets all the plaudits, but he did the same thing essentially a century prior. In his book, he references the 10 lost tribes twice. The first time he references the tribes of Ruvain, God, and half the tribe of Menashe. And he says that he has heard from his travels that they 
there in these mountainous regions. They have large and strong cities. They're constantly conducting warfare with their enemies. But to get to them, you need to march for 18 days through uninhabited deserts, and therefore you can't get to them. He doesn't say that he saw them himself, but he says that's what he's heard. In addition, he tells us that the Jews of Persia, the Jews of what's today Iran, they report that there's the city of Naspur or Nishapur, which is probably in northeastern Iran on the border of Afghanistan. There are four additional tribes of Israel, the tribes of Asher, Dan, Zavulun, and Naphtali. Again, they are 20 days journey, and there's many towns and many cities in the mountains. In the 16th century, a strange, mysterious, and charismatic individual arrived onto the Jewish scene, calling himself David Ruveni, David from the tribe of Ruvain. He appears in Cairo in the 1520s, introducing himself as the ambassador of the 10 lost tribes who are on the other side of the Sambation River. He claims to come from the desert of Chavor. Chavor is one of the places where the Telos tribes are purported to have gone. And in those places, the tribes of Reuven, God, and half the tribe of Manasseh reside. His brother, David, claims, is named Joseph, and he's the king of this Jewish kingdom. And he is now the military general. He travels all throughout the Middle East and travels to Europe as well. And he comes with a plan. His plan is to take his own alleged Jewish army that he has from these three tribes and to create a coalition with the European Christian armies and together to travel to the Holy Land and capture it from the Ottoman Turks, from the Muslims. And he indeed has a meeting with the Pope, And the Pope signs off on this plan. And then he goes to Portugal. Remember, this is already after the expulsion of Jews from Portugal and from Spain. And all the Jews there that are living secretly as Jews, but really uh, displaying themselves as Muslims, they look at him as a liberator. And the king initially reaches out to him and gives him ambassadorial status. But the rabbis, they view him as a charlatan. And he wears that as welcome with the Christians by openly teaching Torah to conversos in Portugal and converting a Muslim Jew to Judaism. He also goes on to claim that he really is the Messiah. After a decade of adventures throughout Europe, he disappears, and it is quite likely that he was killed by the Inquisition. In 1644, another really interesting character His name is Rabbi Menashe ben Israel. He was a rabbi in Amsterdam who also ran his own printing press. And he meets a guy named Aaron Levi, whose other name was Antonio de Montezinos, who was a Portuguese traveler, a Murano Sephardic Jew himself, who had just recently come back from the New World, from America. And this guy claimed that when he got to South America in Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, Venezuela, he met Indian tribes that are practicing Judaism and claimed to be descendants of the tribes of Ruvain and Levi. And he even claims that when he went to meet and greet these Indians, they greeted him by saying the Shema. And this rabbi, Rabbi Menashe ben Israel, he bought the story, hook, line, and sinker, and he believed that this would have, now we finally found all the Jews, and we're going to bring Mashiach. And he wrote a whole book on the subject called Mikvah Yisrael. And interestingly, he used this quote-unquote discovery to successfully lobby for the readmission of Jews to England uh, during Oliver Cromwell's regime. At the time, England was the only country which had no Jews the last of which were expelled in 1290. And he argued that the prophecies foretelling the arrival of the Messiah, we believe it's our Messiah, they believe it's their Messiah, but they would only be fulfilled when the Jews are scattered in all four corners of the world, 
including England. Now we see the Jews are in America, South America, North America. There's only one country that they need to be in order to bring about Messiah. That, of course, is England. And partially due to his efforts, in 1655, Mm -hmm. the Jews were readmitted to England. But again, not a lot of people believe that indeed Native Americans were actually part of the 10 lost tribes. One final instance of maybe trying to find these 10 lost tribes is the efforts of Rabbi Yisrael Mishklov in the 1830s. He was one of the youngest disciples of the Goan of Vilna, and he led the first effort of settlement of the land of Israel by the students and the followers of the Goan of Vilna in the early 1800s. And he is leading the Perushim community, which means the like the ascetic community in Tzfat. And in 1830, he sent an envoy to the deserts of Yemen to go find the 10 lost tribes. And what's really interesting about this is that unlike some of the previous instances where people thought they found them or claimed to be them, this individual is a great Torah giant, very mainstream, and certainly not a kook. And this letter that he sent in the hands of the envoy going to find the Telos tribes is actually quite fascinating. I want to read you some excerpts of this letter. Thus send the dwellers of the land of Israel who abide by the Torah of Moshe to our brethren, the children of Israel, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the Bnei Moshe, who dwell across the river of Sambation, and who pledge allegiance to the king, the king of Israel, who sits upon a mighty throne and who rules over the ten tribes, whose settlement is in the land beyond the rivers of Cush, who camp according to their banners, the tribe of Dan, of Naphtali, of God, of Asher, Issachar, Zavulon, Ruvain, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Shimon. May Hashem be with them and with their king. And he begins, Accept abundant greetings from your brethren, the children of Israel, the last remnant of the tribe of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. And he begins by outlining some of the proofs throughout history of the existence, the the extant existence of the ten lost tribes. Thus said your brothers, Our rabbis have told us that in the year 4640, which is 780, a man, one righteous and upright from the tribe of Dan, Eldad Hadani, testified of their greatness and grandeur, righteousness and holy, saying that Hashem has helped them remain secure in their settlements, safe from the surrounding nations, and that the ways of our holy Torah are clear to them, as transmitted by Moshe, our teacher, at Sinai, and that they adjudicate capital and civil cases in their courts and have reaped the rewards of longevity, prosperity, and honor. So he begins by quoting El Hadani, which was the first one to show after thousands of years of of incommunicado, this guy shows up, El Hadani. And Rabbi Yisrael Mishklov, he's clearly of the belief that this guy was legit. And then he quotes some other episodes of these 10 lost tribes resurfacing. Our fathers tell us that in the fifth millennium, there was a harsh decree in the land of Ashnaz, which is Germany. A one evil Gentile sorcerer wanted to decimate the Jews and our brethren sent trusty emissaries to the holy camp of the sons of Moshe, our teacher, and found them encamped beyond the river Sambation. And Rabbi Meir Chazan, the composer of the Akdamos that we read on Shavuos, he crossed the Sambation on Shabbos. Why? You're not allowed to cross the river on Shabbos, but to save the Jewish nation or to save a Jewish community, you're allowed to do that. And he approached their holy brothers, and they returned dispatched along with him one righteous man by the name of Rabbi Dan. And with great bravery, he sanctified Hashem's name and rescued our brethren in that land, and he too described to them their majesty and their grandeur. Again, he obviously believes that these Tenelos tribes are still around, and they're still vibrant in their upholding of Jewish law and Torah. And now recently, two years ago, our emissaries were in Yemen and with their own eyes saw a man from the tribe of Dan named Yisachar. And he described to them the land and the greatness and the majesty and then poof, he disappeared. And he quotes the Zohar. The Zohar tells us that in the days preceding the coming of Mashiach, some of our brethren of the ten tribes will be discovered. 
so that they will merit together to experience Mashiach in the life of Olam Haba. Therefore, we found the strength we, the Ashkenazi community in the land of Israel, were dispatching to you the wise emissary Rabbi Baruch ben Samuel from the holy city of Tzfat, who was willing to endanger himself and cross seas and deserts until the merciful one shall bring him before your great throne. I cut out 98% of the letter, but he goes on to detail the whole history, filling in the gap, so to speak, that just like he is assuming that we don't know, we know very little about these 10 tribes, they probably know very little about us, the remaining two tribes. So he fills in the whole history of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And then he ends his letter with four requests. Number one, he asks the 10 tribes to pray for us. Number two, he asks them to send someone back, someone who has smicha, like we spoke about last time, someone who has been ordained from someone who has been ordained all the way back to Moshe, send someone back so they could ordain the rest of the rabbis in Israel. Three, they asked for financial assistance. And four, give us a report. Make us, you'll make us very delighted. Give us a written communication in the holy Hebrew tongue answering our inquiries and putting to rest our uncertainties, describe your lands, describe your status, describe your numbers, describe your Torah knowledge, so that we could all know what's happening with our brethren. Sadly, this effort did not yield any tangible fruits. I've only brought a few of the guesses of where the Ten Lost Tribes are. Uh, Their whereabouts are rife with speculation. Uh, the list of places and communities that allegedly harbor the Ten Lost Tribes sort of reads like a list of the United Nations country roles, because basically <laughs> every nation is represented. Azerbaijan, Myanmar, Kurdistan, Kashmir, China, Japan, apparently. Uh, there's an ancient Japanese symbol called the Kagomi Crest, which is identical to the Jewish symbol of the Magain David. Uh, there's the Lemba tribe in South Africa, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, uh, Uzbekistan, Iraq, the Igbu Jews of Nigeria, Yemen, B'nai Menashe of northern India, the Cochin Jews of India, the Pashtun people of Afghanistan, Bukharian Jews, the list goes on and on and on. I want to conclude by quoting an essay from the Maharal, Rabbi Yehuda Lowy. Uh, 1512 to 1609, known, of course, as the Maharal of Prague. And he wrote a book called Netzach Yisrael, which deals with a lot of matters of Messiah and the future. And he gets in, in chapter 34, gets into the whole question of Sambatio and the river and the location of these 10 tribes. He asks a question. Many people may wonder, after all, the cartographers went all over the world. And they never found any river called the Sambatyon. Is there really any place that has not yet been searched? Is there any tribes that have not yet come into contact with the rest of the world that maybe could be hiding, that the Talos tribes are hiding behind them? That's his question. And he says, it's not a good proof, it's not a good question, because maybe there is a place that we don't know about. And he even adds that we know that there's these 10 tribes are surrounded by rivers, by mountains, places that are not easy to access. In addition, he's like, wait a minute, just recently, they discovered the New World, North and South America, massive continents that no one knew existed for a long time previously. Similarly, it's possible that there's a place that no one yet has, uh, no, no, no one has treaded there. And it's, in, it's inaccessible, and the ten lost tribes are still there. And then he adds, he says, we can't find them because God does not want us to find them. The Almighty made a decree that he, quoting the verse again at the end of Deuteronomy, he plucked them out from their land, he cast them away to a different land as this very day, and therefore it's a decree from God that they won't be known and they won't be reconnected with the rest of the nation until the time of Messiah and not earlier. And just as the Almighty decreed that the Jewish people be scattered throughout the land, so too he decreed that they will be separated from their ten lost tribes, their brethren, and therefore will never find where they are. It's one of those great mysteries. The Talmud talks about all these various places where they are. And the verses are so ambiguous and the history is so muddled 
with so many different claims that are so dubious, so unlikely. And the question is, what we have Jews to figure out everything. How can we can't figure out where our 10 tribes, where are they? And the answer is, is that no, they're hiding, they're there, but we can't find where they are because then that's not going to be until Messianic times.